This is the Energy Makers Show, featuring the innovators, financers, and policymakers focused on the global energy demand. Brought to you by NRG, moving clean energy forward. And here's your host, Paul Dickerson. Hi, I'm Paul Dickerson, and welcome to another episode of the Energy Makers Show. First up today, Peter Shaper, Chairman and CEO of Greenwell Energy Solutions, an innovative private equity backed oil field services company focused on chemicals, water, and environmental solutions. Next up, we check in with Robin Kanok, where she meets with Andy Bowman, founder and president of Pioneer Green Energy, discussing the challenges and the opportunities for wind energy in this era of cheap natural gas. All that right after this. Where will the energy come from to move us forward? From natural sources in abundant supply, or perhaps a man-made source? At NRG, we believe innovation will solve our energy needs. That's why NRG is moving away from fossil fuels towards wind, solar, and other sustainable technologies to power the smart grid, the electric car, and our clean energy future. We're using all of our energy to develop more of it. This is the Energy Makers Show, brought to you by NRG, moving clean energy forward. And now, back to the Energy Makers Show with your host, Paul Dickerson. Welcome back to the Energy Makers Show. Our guest now, Peter Shaper, Chairman and CEO of Greenwell Energy Solutions. Peter? Great to have you on the program. Thank you, Paul. Thanks for having me. So tell us about Greenwell. Well, Greenwell is an exciting new business. We we really do three things in the uh, upstream oil and gas service space. We provide specialty chemicals, we treat water and reuse water, and we help companies reduce uh, their environmental footprint for some environmental services. For what types of clients? So our clients are typically, you know, um, the the E&P companies, a lot of the high-level service companies, and then a lot of smaller service companies that have various jobs out there that need chemicals, water, and uh, environmental protection. Well, and competition's only ramped up these days. It is. The competition's interesting, you know, and it's different across each of those market segments that we're in. The biggest for us is chemicals, and we primarily compete against the large integrated chemical companies who manufacture their own and we come about the business a little bit differently we focus on performance and so we investigate across any of a hundred categories of chemicals that we sell to find the very best performing chemical and we bring that to the market under our name without doing any manufacturing just repping whatever the very best that's out there. Now explain to our audience some of these chemicals and what it is that the chemicals are doing. Sure. So in a drilling environment, we have chemicals that that, uh, are lubes or friction reducers or scale inhibitors and things that really help downhole solve problems. In a completion activity, very, very similar, right? You've got a lot of specialty chemicals that are solving problems downhole so that you can run pipe for miles under the ground. And in the production uh, space, we have a lot of chemicals together with some other services we provide that help stimulate wells and bring the production back up to what it used to be by clearing things out of the hole. Why is the chief executive, what's the plan for the company in 2013? Well, the the company is doing very well. So mostly the plan is to to really keep up with the growth. We're we're fortunate that we have great customers who enjoy the service we provide. We're adding value for them. So we have a lot of growth. And so it's hard to get the right people with the right assets in the right place to always meet those customer demands. And that's the focus for us for 2013. And it's my understanding that you you have this unique uh, model for commercializing technology. Can you explain that a bit? We do. One of the things that we really like to do is find small companies, innovators out there who come up with a a great chemical, a great water treatment process, uh, something uh, that helps with environmental protection, and help those guys bring that to the market. So we're constantly looking for the newest and best performing. And that brings us to a lot of small companies and gives them an avenue to get to the market. Which is tough for many to find. How, How do you differentiate? You know, it's very tough. So we have to have true experts across each of the areas that we play that can really help us get in and and differentiate. And usually we do that by lab tests. So we will take anything and actually put it in a lab, simulate the environment where it's going to work, and drive actual results before we take anything to a customer and put it in the field. Then typically we like to run it with the customer and prove the actual results for them. So compare side by side one chemical versus another or one water treatment method versus another so they can prove to themselves the value that we're bringing. So is that how you built Greenwell? Yes, that's very much how we built it. You know, we backed a team that has been in the specialty chemical business for an extended period of time. And they have been out finding innovators and small companies with new products and bringing them to the market for a long time. We've given them a platform with capital and a management team to really be able to expand in a much larger way. And it's very similar on the water 
our side. We've backed a team that's been in water for over 30 years, all of their careers. And we're giving them a platform and the knowledge to know how to come provide a service that's really valuable in the oil field. So are you keeping your eye on the uh, regulations that may come in the second half of the Obama administration? You know, it's very interesting. The, the regulations for us largely vary state by state. And so right now we're really watching the, the Texas legislature and the Railroad Commission and the changes that they're making. In particular, water is a very hot topic, not just in the energy space, but across the whole state. So, yes, keeping a constant eye on regulations and the, and the shifts that are happening with the various government entities is a big job. Exciting. Now, how did you find yourself in this role? Well, I was, uh, after selling my last company, Caprock Communications, I was actively looking in the oil field service space. There were a lot of deals and a lot of opportunities. And the more I talked to customers about pain points and areas where you could really make a difference in their operations, the chemicals and the water treatment and the overlap there and the environmental services just kind of fit right in. So it's, it's an exciting space. Very excited about it. We've backed some great people who've been in the market for a long time. So we're having a lot of fun. Well, and you're a CEO that knows not only the technical side, but you understand the finance side of the business. I do. I do. So I've had an experience in private equity and we're fortunate to have Genesis Park, our private equity firm behind us. So well capitalized, strong management team. We, we know how to grow. We've been through this before. We know how to expand, not just across the country, but globally. And we're real excited about the platform we've got. Well, as a proven entrepreneur, someone who's uh, led to a successful exit on, on multiple occasions, any advice you have for the entrepreneurs listening? Oh, boy. There's, there's a lot of advice, right? I'd have to tell all the entrepreneurs I've made every mistake. So it's not about not making mistakes. You're going to go out and you're going to make a lot of them. It's about persistence and overcoming those mistakes and staying true to what really what you're doing that's really adding value to your clients, because that's who it's all about. Do you think you'll continue to see opportunity in the in the oil and gas space? You know, we're, we're going through this shale boom, right? And, and everyone's trying to figure out in what inning of the ball game we are. Uh, how, how, what's our trajectory? That's a great question. You know, I think we're somewhere in the middle innings. You know, last thing I want to do is be the guy who can project what's going to happen with energy cycles, but it feels like we're somewhere in the middle. You know, the change uh, with technologies that has really opened up shale is going to be with us for a long time. So assuming we get some economic growth and some demand back, I think we're, we're in the middle innings. We've got a long ways to go. But the one thing you know is there will be an energy cycle forever, and we're going to come back down. And so we're building a business to last, to last through those cycles, and something that we're confident is going to be there adding value, whether we're up on the top of the cycle or down at the bottom. And is it through diversification, doing the chemical, the water? How, how do you try and balance? So it's, it's through a few things. You know, the biggest is really knowing what our value proposition is to the customer and making sure what we're delivering is worth a whole lot more than they're paying for it. In that case, even as cycles go up and down, we're going to be in demand. The other piece is understanding we are a service company. No matter what product we're delivering out there, we're really a service company. We're only as good as the service we're delivering today. So we spend a lot of time and money on our culture and on our people and making sure our people really understand our customer and their mission and how we fit in to make them successful. It's important. Now, what, what are some of the challenges you see coming? You know, our, our biggest challenges right now are keeping up with the growth, you know, getting the right people in and trained right and having the right assets in all the right locations um, to meet the customer demand. The next challenge for us is geographic expansion as we continue to add and go to new basins. You know, it takes a lot. It stretches your management team, it stretches your talent, your logistics to, to really make those happen. Those are the challenges we're overcoming this year. Well, it's an exciting time. Thank you for taking time out of your day to come visit with us. Thank you, Paul. Appreciate you having me. And that wraps our discussion with Peter Shaper. We'll be back with more right after this. At BKD, we understand the constantly shifting nature of the energy industry. As a national CPA and advisory firm, we serve energy clients from the beginning to the end of the cycle. Our experienced energy advisors serve approximately 300 energy companies in exploration, midstream, downstream, oil field services, and power production. Plus, we're the largest North American member of the Praxity Global Alliance, which means we can help you wherever you operate. Contact a BKD advisor or visit us online to learn more. This is the Energy Maker Show, brought to you by NRG, moving clean energy forward. And now, back to the Energy Maker Show. Welcome back to the Energy Maker Show. I'm Robin Kanok, and my guest today is Andy Bowman, the President and CEO of Pioneer Green Energy. Welcome, Andy. Thank you for being here. Thank you very much. It's a pleasure to be here. Good. We'll jump right into this. Tell us a little bit about yourself and your background, and then tell about tell us about Pioneer Green. Well, I uh, am a lawyer by training originally. Um, I graduated from law school in 1995 here in Austin, 
And um, not long after that, I started um, the first working in the wind industry, some of the first projects that were being built uh, in West Texas around McKamey. Um, me and a friend of mine uh, worked on the Southwest Mesa project. And that project was finished in 1998 or 99. And um, afterwards, uh, we went on to work on a few other projects that were built um, in that first wave of projects, generally all in the McKamey area. And then I formed my own company in uh, 2002 called Renewable Generation. And, um, and we were developing projects in, in West Texas and, and other parts of the country and eventually developed a, uh, a joint venture with an Irish company called Airtricity. Um, uh, eventually, a couple years after that, Airtricity bought the company that, that we had called Renewable Generation. And then a couple years after that, um, we sold Airtricity to a German utility called Eon. And, uh, and I ran Eon's development activities from Canada across the United States. And I left there in 2008 and then started my current company uh, the next year, uh, Pioneer Green Energy here in Austin. So we've got the production tax credit. Yeah. I'd like to hear from your opinion what that means for the industry. The production tax credit is an interesting feature of the industry because that is the subsidy and and the primary subsidy that the wind energy business gets. And it's a very discreet item in the tax code. And it's typically only extended for a couple years at a time. Um, this most recently only for one year, I believe. Um, in a in a very uh, unfortunate outcome, um, it it's been extended just for one year, with with some provision for projects that get started in the year qualifying later. Yeah. So how does that affect your business planning? It's extremely difficult to um, finance and construct a a wind project of size, and these are typically two, three, four, five hundred million dollar projects. Mm-hmm. So to have all the ducks in a row to have uh, not just one project, but but several um, reach that threshold in such a short window is extremely challenging. It's certainly much better than no production tax credit extension at all, Mm -hmm. which is what we were facing just before the end of the year. But it's about as challenging a situation as as the industry has been in for a long time. And uh, you have to have a set of relationships um, in place to to address those challenges, financing and construction, and you have to have your projects in a really mature state uh, to be able to take advantage of it. I would have to think also the low price of natural gas right now has a major effect on your ability to yes. finance projects. Yes, Texas is unique because natural gas really sets the price for, for the energy markets Definitely. here. But other parts of the country, less so, um, but gas is, is very influential, and so it has definitely depressed prices around the country, and that's a good thing. Um, but it goes back to, um, uh, it really goes back to the, the total cost of energy for each kind of generation. And in windy parts of the country, wind can beat gas uh, hands down today, even, even at these very low gas prices. In less windy parts of the country, uh, wind can't beat um, natural gas. Um, and so uh, it really depends on which market you're focused on, where your projects are, and then what the regulatory regimes are too, because certain states with renewable portfolio standards mm-hmm. have high demand that's going to drive sales of wind and solar, mm-hmm. uh, even outside of price competition. So mm-hmm. it's a lot of factors that go into uh, um, where projects can profitably be, be placed. So here in Texas, wind accounts for anywhere between like 10 and 25 percent of our current generation. Mm -hmm. Uh, How did Texas get to that point? That's a pretty high number. Most people are pretty surprised by that. And what does it mean going forward? I think the roots of uh, the reasons why Texas has so much wind um, go back to the deregulation legislation in the 90s. And uh, that was where, as part of the horse trading around passage of the bill, um, a a, uh, wind renewable um, portfolio standard was passed. And, and that really forced the big utilities in Texas to try wind. And it turned out that that was fabulously effective at um, getting utilities that are totally 
comfortable with dispatchable traditional fossil thermal generation. Mm -hmm. You turn it on, you turn it off, you run it, um, those kinds of things, getting them comfortable with non-dispatchable like wind. Once those utilities got over the hump and became familiar with it, uh, the price point became the real draw. And uh, wind at the wholesale level has been a fabulous bargain for many of the, of the at big At times, Texas negative utilities. pricing, actually. At times, um, maybe too good a bargain, mm -hmm. um, for sure. But, um, but, uh, but if you just look at the, at the price of, of power purchase agreements for wind, um, going back to the late 90s all the way through today, we've had uh, high markets and low markets, but in general, um, the price of wind has been has sold well because what it's been is the price of wind today? Do you know off the top of your um, head? I think wind projects in Texas can definitely be um, constructed in in say the low thirty dollars a megawatt hour, and um, uh, that is a very low price. That is a very low price. Um, I mean, in ERCOT, uh, you know, and particularly if you look forward to what what seems very likely rising energy prices here. Mm -hmm. Uh, and you and you understand that wind has a set price for the term. Mm -hmm. um, uh, wind is going to be very favorably priced com in the competitive market uh, going forward from this point on. Thank you so much, Andy, for coming in today and sharing your story with us. Thank you, Robin. I appreciate the opportunity. And that wraps up this episode of The Energy Makers Show. Heard on the radio and seen online at theenergymakers.com.